I was always interested in pulling stuff apart as a kid. I broke a lot of things and tried to work out how to fix them. I felt like I was starting to become an engineer when I reckoned that I'd fix more stuff than I'd broken. <laughs> That's brilliant, I love that. Let's talk about your education. Went to University of Canterbury, New Zealand uh, for my first degree. So that was a honours degree in mechanical engineering. And then I took a graduate role. From there, I went and did a master's at the University of British Columbia. I came to Bristol and that was my first foray into renewable energy. Um, I'd always wanted to work in wind and that was working with a two-bladed onshore wind turbine. Good people delivering a good product. But when things didn't go so well, it was my engineer engineering team that, that got rid of first. And that's just the way that a lot of organizations work. You'll have your senior managers, you'll have your accountants, you'll have your marketing guys, all these kind of people. They tend to hang in there a lot longer than the engineers. And that was one of the kind of real drivers for me in terms of why I wanted to run my own company. And that's why we run an engineering consultancy run by engineers. Fixed offshore wind is now a really competitive energy source. There's stacks of fake news coming out about it, which is concerning. And I think people need to be aware of, you know, there's certain interests that are trying to stop that, but it's just noise and we need, people need to be aware that we need to get on and do this. What's going on in the offshore wind industry that everybody needs to know about? Wow, there's a question. Hello and welcome back to Clean Talk, the podcast shining a spotlight on inspiring companies within the world of clean technology and renewable energy. I'm Luke, I run Harmer Visuals, a video agency that works with companies in the clean technology and renewable space to bring about climate transformation through data-driven storytelling. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Carl Davis from Empire Engineering. Carl, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thanks, Luke. Nice to be here. Carl, you, you've very nicely given us the space to film in today, which I'm absolutely over the moon about. Tell us a little bit about when you moved into this office. So we moved in about three months ago. It was a pretty tortuous experience, to be honest, um, getting leases in place, all that kind of thing. It's one of those things as... Um, yeah, running a company, you don't really think about all that kind of hassle. Um, fortunately, we've got good people that look after it for us, but it takes a long time to get all that stuff in place. Lots of hurdles to jump through and then fitting out offices. Uh, but we really have to be here because it's a much nicer space than we've been in the past. Carl, let's wind the clock back. Talk to me about your journey to not just founding Empire Engineering, but your career in general in engineering. Take us, take us back to the start. Sure. So my first job in engineering was back in New Zealand, uh, where I grew up. Um, after graduating from the University of Canterbury, went and got a graduate position with a company called uh, Becker. Um, they were kind of a general engineering consultancy in New Zealand, one of the biggest ones. And I was doing building services, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So that, that's where it all started. How practical was that versus theoretical? Uh, so it was practical in the sense that you were designing real things that were going to be built. So, you know, I was working on some cool projects like uh, big stadiums. We were designing all the systems to make those stadiums work um, and, you know, getting to see that stuff got built. So it was pr probably practical. Yeah. The customers of those venues, ultimately, your, your objective is to make sure that they don't even know that your work was there, essentially, isn't it? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, I find that quite interesting, particularly having a background in like AV and video production and stuff like that. Um, you, you know you've done a good job when nobody noticed you existed. Is that, was that your experience? Absolutely. So, um, and you know, I don't do this stuff anymore, but one of the things we were involved with was um, heating and air conditioning and that kind of thing. And um, people only know when that's not working well. And it's really hard to make it work well. Yeah. Um, so if you've done a good job, no one knows about it. And that's actually the role of engineers in a lot of places. You only hear about us when it doesn't work. Let's talk about your education. Take me back. Were you, um, did you go to college, uni? Went to University of Canterbury, New Zealand uh, for my first degree. So that was a honours degree in mechanical engineering. Um, so that's four years back then, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then I took that first job we talked about where it was a graduate role. Uh, and then sh I think after about a year from, uh, from there, I went and did a master's at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so your experience of going around different countries, how is the engineering scene different or the same in those countries? The technical content of what we do is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, the perception of engineers changes massively depending on your location. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Uh, so for instance, in the UK, UK is possibly not the best place in the world to be an engineer because uh, engineers don't have a great standing in the community, I suppose, in many ways. 
they're certainly not paid as well, for instance, as you would get in arguably most of the world. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's one metric of how you measure something, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think engineers have probably, in terms of standing community, people like engineers, they respect engineers. But uh, if you compare an engineer to a banker or a lawyer, you know, the, the salaries are very, very different. Sure. In the UK anyway. Yeah. Sure. So mm -hmm. your interest in this world, when did it, when did it start? I was always interested in pulling stuff apart as a kid, playing for Lego, that kind of thing. Um, I broke a lot of things and tried to work out how to fix them. Um, I felt like I was starting to become an engineer when I reckoned that I'd fixed more stuff than I'd broken. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love, I love that. <laughs> Let's talk specifics. What, what, what were you fixing? What were you breaking? Bikes, motorbikes, boats, um, hand mixes from the kitchen, anything I could take apart that um, I could get away with and thought I could put back together and maybe make it work again. I'd have a crack at. Um, but I kind of grew up in a in a rural sort of environment where um, you know, I grew up in a nursery, but, you know, there's, there's tractors and motorbikes and things break and fences need fixing, all that kind of thing. And so I found that I was... I enjoyed doing that kind of stuff, getting practical and fixing a water pump when it stopped pumping water and those sorts of things. I can imagine your your view of a space when you walk into it is very technical. So like for me, when I watch a film on TV uh, or Netflix or whatever, I'm always thinking about what's happening behind what I'm seeing. You know, is there a guy holding a big, what we call a floppy, trying to diff diffuse or get out some light from an angle where it's bouncing in. When you walk into a, a space, say you walk into Tesco, what do you see? I can imagine you're seeing lots and lots of systems. <laughs> Engineers are very risk adverse. We're, we're trained to be very risk adverse. We look for the things that are going to go wrong. So if I'm somewhere like Tesco's, I actually will often be looking at the top shelves and thinking, is there something heavy up there that's going to fist up, fall on someone? It's just the way that you're kind of trained to look for the risks. Would you consider yourself an artistic person? I, I remember telling my art teacher in school that my... Uh, artistic talents were still hiding and may always be hiding. Art is something I've always struggled with, but as an engineer, you need to be able to communicate through drawing. Um, and I've had to work on that a lot because I, it was just not something I'm very talented at. Um, I can now do a functional drawing, but if I'm in a meeting and I'm with any of my team, I will always ask anyone else in the room that I can to do the drawing so I don't have to. Sure, sure. <laughs> You've worked at 11 different companies from your LinkedIn profile across the last 24 years. Talk me through that journey. Wow. Uh, I don't know if I can even name all 11. Okay. So the first one was Becker. Uh, and that was really interesting coming as a graduate engineer. Um, you know, you graduate from the engineering degree and you think you know what you need to know and you turn up to a job and you realize, uh, wow, I, they haven't taught me anything. <laughs> um, not strictly true. Obviously your skills are, are useful, but there's a lot to learn when you first start your First job, most people find that. Um, so I was there, and then I went and did my uh, uh, master's in uh, Canada at the University of British Columbia, yep. which was a really fun place to be. Uh, from there, I, I actually found it really hard to get the next job um, after my master's degree, um, and I was fortunate enough to get an offered a job with a company called WBM in Brisbane, Australia. Um, so I moved to Australia for that, and I was there for a couple of years, I guess. From there, and, and that was doing um, a mixture of rail engineering and a lot of mining work um, wow. in, in coal mines. I can be very smug and say that I work in renewable energy now, but I, <laughs> you know, I worked in coal mining, so you know. You <laughs> but that was really interesting, um, going out to coal mining sites, working with massive machinery, getting properly dirty, all that kind of thing. It's a good experience. Um, and it was a really interesting company and got lots of friends that I met there and work with, uh, you know, I still keep in touch with. That's Brilliant. That's a long time ago. Uh, from there, uh, I'd kind of, I was looking for a change, um, and I moved to London. Um, I had lots of friends living in London as lots of Kiwis do and just went there to, with, on a, uh, working holiday visa and just threw my CV around and see if I could find any, a job. Mm -hmm. Um, and eventually it was a struggle again, actually, uh, got a job with a company called Mott McDonald Railway Approvals. Okay. Um, and that was on the Cooling the Tube project. Um, so that was the London Underground had this, continues to have a problem with, it generates lots of heat, gets really warm. Mm -hmm. And so I was involved with helping to basically oversee that project to make sure it delivered what it was meant to deliver. Uh, weird job, weird organisation, um, slightly strange experience. 
but uh, I learned lots from it. And I, I think I lasted six months in London before I got offered a job in Bristol um, and been in Bristol for a while since then. Um, so I came to Bristol and got offered a job working with a company called Nordic Wind Power. Yep. That was my first foray into renewable energy. Um, I'd always wanted to work in wind. I never really had an opportunity to get there. Um, and this was it. So I mm-hmm. took that job. Uh, and that was working with a two-bladed onshore wind turbine. Okay. Um, which we were sort of developing essentially and um, got to build an engineering team and met lots of good people and um, did interesting work. But that company eventually went out of business, as, okay. as a lot, of, lot did around that time. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the kind of real drivers for me in terms of why I wanted to run my own company. Um, we built a really good engineering team that uh, was delivering well, good people, um, delivering a good product. But when things didn't go so well, it was my engineering team that that, that got, got rid of first. Um, wow. Yeah. And that's just the way that a lot of organizations work. Um, you'll have your senior managers, you'll have your accountants, you'll have your marketing guys, all these kind of people. They tend to hang in there a lot longer than the engineers. The engineers are seen as being a bit disposable. Uh, and I don't like that. Um, Interesting. <laughs> so one of the reasons that kind of spurred me onto the idea of if we're going to fail, what's going to fail because I didn't do a good job as opposed to other people. Um, right. And that's why I like the idea of running my organization. It kind of pushed me towards that. One of the biggest burdens or responsibilities to start a company is that everything ultimately lands on your shoulders if something goes wrong. Yep. Um, Hand in hand with that comes the fact that by virtue of being an engineer, you're constantly problem solving. How do you deal with the process of problem solving, delegating problem solving, and knowing that ultimately it's still on your shoulders to take responsibility if something goes wrong? That's a really good question and that's a real challenge. So, you know, when you build up a team of people, you do your best to hire the best people you can and you have to trust them. Um, But, you know, if you've started a company, you're probably a bit of a control freak. It's just the nature of this. Like most most entrepreneurs you'll meet, you know, control freak, it's kind of the nature of it. Um, And if you're successful, you tend to be successful because you're quite good at doing certain things. Um, And it's really hard to hand off things that you think you can probably do better than someone else. Um, A lot of that's ego. uh, But... In reality, you've got to trust your people. Yeah. If you're not trusting your people, what was the point of hiring them? Yeah. Yeah. And also what you find is that by trusting those people, they get better. They'll make some mistakes. But um, if empowering. you take, Sorry? It's about empowering, isn't it? It is. It is exactly. It's about empowering people. Let them make some mistakes because you know you've made plenty. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, maybe they don't give you the best solution the first time you ask them to solve a problem for you. Um, But it's about having the vision that, okay, in six months' time, when you ask them to solve those problems, they'll be much better. And potentially they'll be much better than you. Yeah. And in reality, they've probably got more time to solve that problem than you. So at some stage, they will be much better than you are. How do you work out whether a problem is worthy of your time or the people in your team's time? How How do you kind of draw the line between this is a, you know, the kind of important and urgent, just urgent, just important who am I delegating and how do I determine whether to or not? It's tricky. Like some of it's just um, about how much time you've got. Um, if you're not particularly busy for some reason and you've got more time to delegate to something, then you'll, you maybe you pick something up yourself. Other, sure. to- other times if you haven't got the time, then you just have to hand it off to whoever's got the free hand. Yeah. Um, because the person that's got a bit of time to dedicate to it is probably going to do a better job. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're not, then they're going to learn from it. So, you know, you have to kind of trust in that. The bit where it gets tricky is where there's responsibility involved and making decisions that aren't quite, you know, have real consequences. Um, as engineers, we have processes in place around that. So I might hand off quite a tricky problem to a graduate engineer, but we'll have a process in place that that work then gets checked by someone appropriate and it won't get approved until it's gone past myself or one of our partners. Mm-hmm. So engineering wise, there's processes there, you know, to mm-hmm. make sure that quality is always maintained. You've worked with with Stu. Stu is a business developer and marketer. Coming from a technical background, getting that commercial skill set to standard, what was that like? Was it a challenge? 
<laughs> it's still a challenge. <laughs> I'm an engineer um, and I find myself in a position of running a company. Uh, and uh, there was a, a point in my career where I thought about doing a, um, an MBA, Master in Business Administration. Mm -hmm. Like I, I saw myself in this kind of role, maybe not running my own company, but maybe running another company. Yeah. And I thought, well, those sorts of skills would be really handy. Um, and I considered going and uh, doing some, you know, doing a course. Uh, but by that stage, you know, I'd done a couple of degrees and I felt like if I need to learn something, I can pick up a book and learn it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd rather than, uh, you know, going and doing a degree, I just have a crack and make some mistakes and learn that way. Yeah. Because that sounded more interesting. Um, so in, in kind of response to your question, how have I learned that? I've learned it by trying and, um, and, you know, as a business grows, you find more and more your inadequacies, I think, yeah. uh, because, uh, as a small organization of a few a handful of people, the commercial stuff, you know, it's all pretty straightforward. You can work it out. Once it gets a bit bigger, it gets a lot harder. Um, and then you need to start to look for external support. So that's why we use Stu um, from Make the Break. Um, and he comes and helps us with marketing and business development. Um, and that's been a really interesting process because seeing someone that is really, really good in that space and applying like a, a professional filter to how you tackle that problem as opposed to an engineer saying, we need to sell some stuff. Um, I guess we should talk to some people and send some emails, you know, it's yeah. just completely different program. Yeah. Um, it's been a huge learning experience. Yeah. In the social media age, it's easy to, and we see lots of examples of this, people creating brands actually without products or services. With your background of the product and the service comes first, what do people in the age of social media uh, influence and, and branding need to know about developing a, a robust solution before they go to market? It's very easy to see influencers making lots of money by doing things that are a bit inane as far as I'm concerned, you know, by wearing a watch and brushing the hair, they will sell the watch, then this kind of stuff. Um, now that works for a very, very small slice of people. It's not going to work for everyone else pretty much. You need to have a far, far more developed strategy. Um, and there's really well-defined processes of how you do that, you know, work out what your product or service is, um, work out what the market wants, all these kind of things. You need to build it up quite systematically. Um, it's not easy. It takes real time and effort. Um, but those processes, if you follow them, and you know, most of your marketing guys, they'll have have, have learned this uh, um, at some stage. Uh, you follow those processes through, through to understand your customers, understand their problems, and address them. This is this is what you need to be doing. Um, if you don't do that, you're gonna fall on your face. What are the what are the processes? Understanding your client is is a key part of that, um, and understanding their needs and making sure you're addressing those. That's your starting point. Um, but beyond that, there's a whole host of work that has to go go on to to try to access them and understand them. And yeah, um, we get lots of help with with this stuff because it's not natural to me. Selling is not natural to me, and it's not natural to engineers. It's really difficult for an engineer. Because we can, engineers are trained to see the problems yep. and see the weaknesses in everything we do, um, which is a really, really bad way to sell a product or a service. Um, so for engineers, anyway, for technical people, it's a complete mindset switch. Um, and some people can do it and some people really struggle with it. I find it really hard. Was it, you were saying you point out the flaws in your own work? Yeah. Yeah. How... <laughs> Is, is that just innate to being an engineer? I mean, I, I, I find it with video, if I'm, if I'm editing for a, pro, a video project, you know, and I go to show it to somebody, I'll get halfway through showing the video and they'll be like, That's, that bit's not done. Or I need to tw tweak that. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's not just engineers that do that. Obviously, you're completely right. But engineers, we do really focus on that stuff um, because... You're trained to be conservative and careful. You're always looking for the bits that you can't do or can't do as well as you want to do. And you're right, other other industries will do that as well. But for us, um, it, it's definitely a, a specific challenge. Let's talk about empire engineering, vision, mission, values. Take me away. This stuff I always struggle with, if I'm honest, um, because it changes uh, and it's not straightforward. 
But the vision, I suppose, for the company is a group of smart people doing cool things to enable renewable energy. That's kind of what we're all about. Yeah. Um, uh, and we're, you know, growing to do that because the, the, you know, the industry needs more support. So we need to be better at what we're doing. We need more of us to be doing it. So, you know, that's kind of where we're, where, where we're heading. Mm -hmm. yeah. What does your average project look like? Um, and I'm finding asking engineers, the, the word average just doesn't cut it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a typical project for us, it's really hard to say a typical project. You know, we work in a very specific narrow niche, which happens to be offshore wind turbine foundations. Um, and, but when a client comes to us, they've got all sorts of problems that they might want to solve. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is uh, our team's not big enough. We don't have the experience. We just need some people to come and help us. Um, and we do that a lot. So, you know, just plugging experienced people into projects and helping them deliver it. Um, so that's specifically on the foundations part of the offshore wind farm, putting people in to try and help get that design where it needs to be and get it built. Um, that's a kind of classic project. The other classic projects, I suppose, is um, it's early stage in this offshore wind farm. Uh, we know a little bit about what it's going to look like, but we need you to tell us more specifically what these foundations will look like so we can start building up budgets and plan this project. They're more typical as well. What has Empire Engineering got in the pipeline for the future? Ways that you're um, changing your workflow or improving it? working on new projects, what's, what's new? What are you excited about? There's lots of new stuff coming in in terms of projects we're going to be involved with. Um, so that's always exciting, working on new projects. Um, we do lots of internal research and development mm -hmm. on tools and processes of, you know, way to do things better. Um, and, you know, that's all quite exciting stuff as well. Um, so the sort of things we're doing there is um, a lot of automation so that we can do things much quicker and faster and more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have in-house coders writing scripts and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Do you have a particular case study or two that you're either working on now or you've worked on in the past that you think kind of exemplifies what you set out to do with Empire? One of our biggest projects has been Dogger Bank. Um, so most people are aware of Dogger Bank because they will have heard it in the news and that kind of thing. Um, and that's the project I worked on for the longest. Um, I think I've been involved with that project for about 12 years now. And wow. that, that predates Empire. Um, we kind of had a little bit of involvement with it when we were doing initial MET masts. So that's putting out um, meteorological masts to measure wind speeds and wave and that kind of thing before the wind farm goes in. Mm -hmm. um, so I was involved in that many years ago. And then since then, um, we've been very heavily involved with um, developing that project, particularly on the foundations package. So putting, um, so myself, I was involved in that for a couple of years. Um, so, you know, defining uh, what the foundations were going to be like going through the process of design, overseeing that. Um, and, you know, we've still got people heavily involved in that project today. Let's talk about founding and managing. We've talked about this a little bit, but we'll go deeper into it. So what's been your experiences of some challenges of founding your own company? Some of the challenges with running a company, I think um, when you start out, when you're small, it's maybe, it, it feels like it was easier then in many ways because you can keep it all in your head. Yeah, you know, you've got two or three people working for you. You know what they're doing mostly and, and that kind of thing. You know what the projects are. Um, as things start to scale, particularly at the scale we are now, we're about 20 people, um, it gets, you can't just keep it all in your head. Um, you've got to have other people helping. You've got to have processes in place, all these kind of things. Um, you know, just finance, for instance. Um, how do you manage to make sure that you've got money coming in and the right amount coming out and that kind of thing? Um, and there's a lot of work involved with that, which doesn't make you any money, but someone's got to keep an eye on it. Um, and we have great people that help us with that. Um, but it's stuff that I guess I underestimated how much work it is. Um, and, you know, it's massively important. Um, recruiting good people, that's really, really difficult. Um, you know, so we interview lots of people, we hire a few, uh, and in an hour interview working out how good someone's going to be and how good they're going to fit. It's incredibly difficult to do, I think. Do you take a particular approach for an industry specific approach? Are you looking for certain characteristics in people that, that are specific to the fact that you're 
in offshore renewables? Is, is, is that affecting who you're choosing at all? It really depends upon what we're looking for at the time. Um, historically, we always look for people with lots of experience within offshore wind because um, that's what our clients wanted. Um, as we've grown up and the industry's grown up, we've we had to be more broad and bring in people with more diverse experience and train them and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, so it, it, it always changes depending on what you're looking for at the time. Um, but yeah, we do definitely look for people that have a certain skill set and experience that leans towards our direction, for sure. Energy projects often have complex stakeholder relationships. How do you navigate that and bring the best outcomes for everybody? In terms of energy projects and their stakeholders, that's much more broader than we typically work, if I'm honest. Um, there's, there's, there's people that, you know, devote their career to engaging with the particularly communities. Um, in offshore wind, one of the classic ones that you have to deal with is fishermen. Um, fishermen are typically quite difficult to deal with when you work in the offshore space um, and you've got to get them on side to allow your projects to go ahead. Um, but they're typically very well organised as kind of a, as a group and if they want to stop you building a project, they certainly can. And French fishermen are particularly passionate. Um, and French love their food and that, you know, that's where it's coming from. Uh, but I'm, I'm aware that the French fishermen, I think they basically blockaded some projects, went wow. out and, and put their, their boats in places that made people's lives really difficult. Um, you know, and like I say, if, if fishermen want to stop a project, they've got the power to do that. Um, so, you know, it gets pretty interesting pretty quickly. Uh, and what happens out at sea, that's a whole new ball game, right? Wow. Yeah. Your LinkedIn header headline reads <laughs> you know what's coming <laughs> reads problem solver chocolate lover tell us more about that uh i'm a fan of chocolate yeah and um linkedin is really interesting uh i've been using linkedin since i set up the company uh because i saw that as probably quite a good way to tell people about what we were doing um and very easy to be boring just put the same as everything else everyone else puts by telling something something about myself which is that i like chocolate that just gives gives people an in lots of people when they contact me on linkedin will will ask about chocolate people will send me chocolate you know <laughs> it's, it's just slightly more interesting than the usual stuff linkedin can be a strange platform yeah you want to maintain in integrity and professionalism but at the same time um the the move of of digital communication is towards authenticity and, and, and sort of personality. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see what LinkedIn's like in 10 years time. Yeah. So I've been using it for a long time. I've got a pretty good following, I think. Um, but one of my most um, kind of commented and followed posts was, uh, I guess the start of this year, I, I was at a conference and when I travel for work, <laughs> traveling for work is terrible for your health because you tend to be eating bad food. You probably don't sleep very well. Your routines are all out. So I try and do a bit of exercise. So I went for a run before this particular conference. Uh, and I don't like running, but I know it's good for me. So I do it anyway. Um, I write that. I think that's good. <laughs> and anyway, so what's become a bit of a theme is people putting up these um, veneered photos of them running before conferences. Um, and that's not me. So I thought, well, I'm going to be authentic. <laughs> and I put a post up of, this is me after a run before this conference. Um, running. I hate it. It hurts a lot. That's my most viewed post on LinkedIn, I think. Wow. <laughs> what have you learned about LinkedIn from that? <laughs> uh, people do like stuff that's real because um, there's so much uh, how fantastic everything is. Um, and people are actually reasonably good at just seeing through that. Um, and if you put up things that are a bit more entertaining, and, and a bit more real, you just get more engagement. We're going to jump into quickfire curiosity now. So okay. a few quick questions. Mm -hmm. What's been your most unexpected learning from your engineering career and how has it shaped your view of the world on a more existential level? In many projects, engineers are actually very low down on the totem pole and that um, they can be viewed as being quite disposable. Uh, and that if you want to live in that world, then you probably want to change that. And that's why we run an engineering consultancy run by engineers. I like that. That would make a good tagline. <laughs> <laughs> How have your career ambitions changed over time? I started out wanting to be really strong technically. That's what as an engineer, what always drove me, being really good in that area. Uh, but over time, 
it became obvious to me that whilst I'm technically you know good at what I do, I'm actually better at managing and okay. and putting everything together and seeing the bigger picture. Um, and that's what I do as part of running the company, but also do that with some projects. And I and as I worked out that that's what I'm really good at doing, I've kind of headed in that direction more because it just makes sense. Would you consider yourself a futurist? I'm going to have to ask you to define futurist for me. What do you I'd, mean by I'd that? actually prefer it if you could define futurist. I'd like to think a futurist is someone that cares about the future. Someone that uh, looks forward and sees that, uh, how do we make sure that we still exist and live well in the future? That's what I'd like to think a futurist is. I, I'm not sure if many other people would see it that way. Um, and by that definition, I'm absolutely a futurist. You know, I'm very much engaged in trying to work out how do we make sure that um, the earth is still here and a good place to live for um, future generations, you know, my children, all that kind of thing. Because um, I think we've got a responsibility to do that. Where do you find your sense of purpose as an engineer? And what, make, what motivates you to do the small and mundane everyday things? We've talked about your interest in the details, but for the bits that you don't particularly like, what's motivating you? I think there's an acceptance that in any job, there's stuff that has to be done by someone. Uh, and it's, it's just part of the process. Um, and you just have, kind of have to accept that. Um, and I'm accepting of that and we'll get stuck in and get that stuff out of the way so I can do the stuff I really want to be doing. Um, I guess that's my process. There's probably better ways of doing it, but that's how I get it done. Mm -hmm. Is just accept that, yeah, that someone has to do this and I can't delegate it. I may as well get stuck in and do it. But if I'm honest, I'm a pretty big procrastinator. And, um, you know, there's plenty of times where there's those things that I don't want to do that don't get done for a while until they really need to be done. Um, but that's just life. Yeah. What's going on in the offshore wind industry that everybody needs to know about? In terms of fixed offshore wind, we work in fixed and floating. Um, they're two very different animals. Um, fixed offshore wind is now a really competitive energy source. It's, you know, price-wise pretty close to anything else you'll build. It's brilliant in terms of being environmentally friendly. It can produce lots of energy. Um, it's the way that we should be doing, producing as much energy as we possibly can. Um, there's some environmental downsides, but they're pretty limited. Uh, there's stacks of fake news coming out about it, uh, which is concerning. And I think people need to be aware of, you know, there's certain interests that are trying to stop that. Um, but it's just noise and we ne people need to be aware that we need to get on and do this because it's really existentially important for us. Um, the other side of offshore wind at the moment is floating. And that's a very new emerging technology that's really, really tricky. Super interesting for engineers to solve that problem, but it is not a solved problem. And um, the perception, I think, for a lot of people is that fixed and floating wind are very similar, but floating wind is still really under development, really early stage, really hard to do well. And it's going to be a while before that's fully baked and actually being deployed at commercial scale. If you could speak to your former self, your younger self, finding his way through life and his career, what would be your key pieces of advice? Enjoy the journey. Because that's what you've got. I, I think that's really important. Um, uh, I think a lot of us get hung up about the idea of things are going to be great when you get there. You know, and, and that's, that's an idea that certainly was in my head for a long time, and I'm sure is in others. Um, and you, it's, it's not a good place to be. You really have to be able to focus on enjoying what you're doing at the time. Um, and that would be my advice. For those listening who want to pursue a career in engineering, what common misconceptions do you think risk tripping them up the most? I guess that it's not sexy. For those who don't really know what they want to do, they might know they want to work in renewables, maritime or offshore wind, but for all intents and purposes, it's still unclear. What questions would you encourage them to ask themselves to spot the best opportunities? Firstly, to anyone that's in the position of not quite sure what they want to do, um, I'd say that's okay and that's normal and get comfortable with that um, and you will have opportunity to change. Um, in terms of spotting the opportunities, um, you need to look at yourself and work out what you enjoy doing. Um, hopefully that's what you're good at, but it's not always. 
uh, and try and, and, and head towards directions that, of things that you like to do. Simple as that. We've got people listening in from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of jobs within the renewable sector. What one piece of advice do you want to leave them with before we close off? The renewable sector is a fabulous place to be working. It's really challenging. It will continue to be challenging on multiple levels. There's technical challenge, there's political challenge, there's all these sorts of things going on. Um, I guess the one piece of advice I'd say is that, uh, I don't know if it's advice, but what I would say is that it's incredibly important. It's important not just today, but important for future generations. It's the right thing to be doing. It's a great choice to have made. So, um, you know, give it your best shot. Carl, thank you so much. Uh, it's been brilliant talking to you, finding out about Empire Engineering. And again, thanks so much for hosting this, along with several of our other episodes for this season. Um, yeah, thanks so much for your time. You're very welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank awesome. you. Thanks for tuning in again, and we will catch you in the next episode.